Um, okay, so welcome back. Here is part two of um, Oceanic Aesthetics. Let me just share screen with you. And uh, slideshow, play from start. Okay, great, there we go. Okay, so let's think about the oceans then as um, this kind of neglected realm that maybe art can help us to understand. As the marine biologist Helen Scales notes, and actually uh, I think I'll make this available for you, but it's one of the short essays in the book version of Jason DeCare's Taylor's The Underwater Museums. There's two kind of contextual essays that are very useful, and one is by Helen Scales. And she writes, for most people, most of the time, the oceans are out of sight and out of mind. Steering popular opinion in favour of this neglected realm is one of the greatest challenges facing marine conservation today. On their own, the facts of environmental decline can be difficult to digest, especially when life as we know it carries on normally around us. So I'm going to spend much of tonight's uh, lecture in part two here thinking about these underwater um, sculptural installations uh, organised into a series of parks that Jason DeCares Taylor has been building up over the past um, decade. But before I do so, I just thought I'd give you a bit of context because he's not the only contemporary artist obviously dealing with issues to do with marine conservation, activism and um, environmental uh, issues as well. So I wanted to give you some context in terms of a few other select pieces of contemporary art which I think are similarly working with marine and oceanic environments as a deliberate strategy of intervention into conservationist politics and they're trying to use their art in different ways to educate and engage um, this growing public interest in oceanic issues. So the examples I've taken then are from a project called Ephemeral Coast and this is a collaboration and I can give you the link to the website so you can have a little look around. Um, it's a collaboration between uh, Selena Jeffrey, who is a scholar working in the Blue Humanities, uh, and also a number of marine biologists, climate change scientists um, and artists. And they work in a variety of media, as you're going to see in a moment. We've got some multimedia video installations. We've got some kind of interactive pieces with, between artists and audience and galleries. Uh, and we've also got kind of traditional paintings and photography and things. And I think that these pieces then raise provocative questions. Um, they ask us to think maybe how art could foster a dialogue with rapidly depleting blue ecosystems. So things like endangered coral reefs in the example of Jason DeCare's Taylor. They ask us maybe to, to think about whether art can or should attempt to negotiate the degradation of the world's oceans, something which affects human and also non-human life. What are the ethics involved in this kind of um, aesthetic representation and what are its impacts? Reflecting on some of the installations within Ephemeral Coast then, Selena Jeffrey concludes that, um, and I quote, such aesthetic strategies are at odds with the historic narratives of the epic or the sublime sea which dominated 19th century art and with the fascination with the industrialized aesthetics of oceanic travel and formalist inquiries within modernism. So I want to spend the next sort of half an hour then trying to think about this idea of oceanic aesthetics, this term um, how do artists, photographers, filmmakers, videographers and performance um, artists draw on a kind of embodied and materialist conception of the ocean in response to climate crisis and the climate emergency? And how does their work, and it's very recent, the things we're going to be looking at now are really produced in the last five years, I guess, differ from previous aesthetic responses to the sea? And then finally, how can we as viewers or spectators refine our own critical sensibilities to interpret and contextualize um, these works? Okay, so the first up then is um, a piece called Glacier Elegy um, by the Estonian born performance artist, Janneke Pirna. And this was featured as part of an exhibition, um, These Waters, 
have stories to tell, which took place at the Glyn Vivian Art Gallery in Wales uh, just two years ago in 2018. So I've got a little clip. This is um, a performance piece um, and I think it's worth having a little look at it. So just bear with me. I'll go over onto YouTube and play you just the first couple of minutes. Here we go. going to skip a little bit so you can see that she's engaging with the audience a little bit later on as well. <laughs> As you can see then, Janneke Pirna was engaging with the audience in that gallery in this very kind of abstract, very gestural, embodied way. She had that long role of um, mylar, this particular kind of polyester film which is used in plastics packaging products and is known for this very sort of tensile strength. And she also had some um, melting blocks of ice that she was encouraging the audience to kind of touch and engage with. Um, and so the, the body movements then, Selena Jeffrey um, includes this within her project and writes about this piece and she says the way in which the artist's bodily movements then enact this embodied temporality of melting ice sort of helps us to participate in the messiness and the uncertainty of rising sea levels and global warming. It encourages the audience to engage with and accept this performative acceleration um, of the blocks of ice, which is representing the vanishing of the polar glaciers. As Jeffrey writes then, these gestures of communal action, which reimagine the world in collective and creative terms, may also point to communal responsibility and to the significance of hope. So particularly those interactive um, parts of, of, um, of that performance art piece where the spectators in the gallery are encouraged, particularly children I noticed if you watch the full clip, um, to kind of draw on the polymer and um, the plastic, sorry, the mylar plastic and to uh, touch the blocks of ice gives us some sort of affective emotional connection and perhaps a sense of shared responsibility which is very interesting. 
So we might say then that Peerna's performance brings together many of the strands that underpin post-humanist thinking within the environmental humanities. So we're talking here then about rethinking the human as inescapably entangled within ecological, mycological, microbial systems, connecting us with larger bodies of water, as we saw in the part one of the lecture with Astrid and Imanis's hydrofeminism, and attempting to grasp the materiality of a process which would otherwise seem um, abstract and theoretical. So we're straining then to comprehend timeframes beyond our own limited human anthropocentric perspective. And we're struggling to come to terms with the rapidly accelerating loss of biodiversity. And um, naming this performance Glacier Elegy then, Pina attests to the kind of act of memorialising, remembering, of undertaking care and responsibility for um, and adjusting to the sense of disaster and also of risk. <laughs> Sorry, that's my cat yowling in the background. It's a bit posthumanist, I guess. He's having his say. Uh, okay, so another piece then, a uh, recent artwork which um, asks similar questions, I think, is the Sydney-based artist Julia Davies' 27-piece Undercurrent. Now this is a site-specific um, video installation. It shows um, an endlessly looped video of wave action taken from a bird's eye perspective off the Tasmanian coast. So let's have a little look at this one. It's available on her website. Okay, that's probably, I mean, I could listen to that for hours, but that's <laughs> probably enough for now. You can listen, you can go and watch more of it later. Um, so it's got this very meditative sort of slow down temporality and the fact that it's on this video, um, this kind of looped video with this sub oceanic sound. Um, what's particularly interesting is that the, the, the sound recording actually refers to oceanic contexts in peril, in crisis. Um, the soundscape used then was taken partly, she mixed it and she remixed it, but part of it was taken from a hydrophonic recording made back in 1997 of an iceberg at the moment that it broke off from the Antarctic ice shelf as a result of global warming. Um, so <clears throat> we may respond, <laughs> those of us who listen to a lot of white noise perhaps, um, to that sort of soundscape um, in a very confused con conflicted set of emotions it's sort of smooth and slow and calming and yet it is itself a sound of uh, environmental crisis okay next up then is a piece called surfer's ear it's a very small sculpture made by alexander duncan who's a young artist recently did his ma at the royal college of art he collected foam earplugs that he found washed up on the banks of the River Thames in London. Um, and uh, he decided to carve one out of a piece of found whale ear bone, which is what we can see here. Um, as he says then, uh, I quote, I was fascinated by the bodily intrusion of denying yourself a sense by ramming a piece of shaped foam into your ear. In using this material, the whale bone, I hoped it would allude to the unknown effect that oceanic noise pollution has on a mammal's communication, end quote. So you can also see there's some tiny barnacles that were on the whalebone that he used, uh, that he carved into this um, uh, simulacra, I guess, of, um, of a foam earbud. 
Uh, and again, that critics would say that that reminds us of the interspecies nature of oceanic life, of these entangled oceanic hybrids, um, but also of um, that sense of the marine violations of human caused debris in the oceans and of oceanic pollution, both noise pollution, which he refers to because um, whale communication is disturbed by noise pollution from industrial fishing and things like that. Um, so, but also um, obviously plastic, microplastics as well. Okay, and here's another one by Christian and Noe Sade. Um, and this, uh, this is part of a series that they have on a website called Plankton Chronicles, where they study phytoplankton and zooplankton. Um, so this combines their respective backgrounds. Uh, Christian is a developmental bi marine biologist and Noe is a filmmaker and a multimedia artist. And so as they write then on their website, they believe that contemporary art is um, a unique process, as they say, through which we may discover, analyse, reimagine and reframe the emotive discourses surrounding the ecological and cultural transformations of the coastline, end quote. So this pair work in various different coastal spaces. They've worked in Mauritius, Wales, Mexico, the United States and Canada. They collaborate with artists um, and other scholars. Uh, and their work, as Selena Jeffrey puts it then, um, uh, reminds us of this nexus of understanding between art, empathy and the oceans, and specifically in the context of oceanic degradation, which is the term used to talk about um, depletion of biodiversity and increasing toxification, acidification, all of those other um, problems I've already mentioned earlier. So this photo then that I've shown you here from 2017 depicts microscopic diatoms. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Please correct me if anybody knows any better. Um, and this is a particular type of phytoplankton. Um, so these tiny microscopic algae are responsible for creating the biomass, which then fuels the aquatic food chain. They also act as a carbon sink. So they're incredibly important. And um, this act of blowing up these microscopic uh, diatoms into um, this kind of portrait photograph um, sort of makes visible something that would otherwise be um, impossible to perceive with the naked human eye. So sort of microalgae floating along in the dark um, have become something, um, you know, reminds us of the thing which eludes our perception but is also essential for our very survival. They generate up to half of the Earth's oxygen. So through, through these photographs, which play with scale, um, with this making visible something which would otherwise be imperceptible, we get to glimpse the possibility of what it might be like to see from a non-human perspective and maybe to think like we are part of an intricate marine ecosystem. So it's shifting our sense of perspective here. Um, and here's a little quote from uh, Selena Jeffrey, who I've been mentioning throughout, and she says, there is something magnificent, sensuous even, about these lilting configurations in motion which bring awareness to how diatoms form webs of interdependency that nourish all oceanic habitats. Even in marine protected waters or wild zones, it is not possible to shelter these molecular ecosystems from ocean warming, from acidification or from plastic, all of which permeates and flows through ocean. Uh, from plankton to whales. So here then we have this coming together of art, of this um, aesthetic practice of making art with activism. It's designed to educate and inform the viewer around issues to do with protecting marine environments, raising awareness of oceanic pollution, microplastics in particular. Um, okay, so um, this example then uh, I think is a really interesting one from Shiraz Bayou, who's um, a London-based artist. As we've already seen in um, earlier lectures that talked about the Anthropocene, so particularly when we looked at mushrooms, mycological fictions and also at Mad Max, and we're thinking here about the Anthropocene understood as this new geological epoch in which human activity has shifted the planet's geological and meteorological systems into this sort of new period. Um, 
we were talking, weren't we, about the way in which um, industrialization and um, modern capitalism and also colonialism have resonated and shaped those processes. Um, and they continue to um, uh, reverberate through contemporary issues to do with climate change, environmental disaster and climate emergency. And so that's why um, Shiraz Bayou's work is really, really interesting. He, um, originally from Mauritius, he focuses on the Indian Ocean through painting, photography and video. And he specialised, I picked out some here for you, these miniature paintings, um, which he uses to try and remind the viewer of forgotten histories of exploitation and marginalisation and to oops, emphasise the importance of post-colonialism to the blue or the oceanic humanities. So he has a series uh, well, two series. There's the Rococo series and there's the Oceanic Miniatures series. Um, and in the Rococo series, he uses those Rococo inspired plaster frames um, to think about islands within the Indian Ocean, so specifically Rodriguez and Mauritius. And he invites the viewer to reflect upon um, Rococo, this 18th century um, colonial aesthetic. You may know. Uh, uh, that it's elaborate, it's abundant, it's highly ornamental, but of course it's an aesthetic that was made possible by the accumulation of vast wealth and, con and also of conspicuous consumption. These were paintings, furniture, cabinetry and so on that would have been displayed in elegant aristocratic houses. Rococo was a signifier of um, kind of the latest in fashion um, and so it's kind of connected with that global circuit of trade. Um, Beiju then describes this uh, as violence framed as romanticism, that is the, the Rococo style, and his miniature paintings recall the central function of the Indian Ocean in providing passage for these colonial sea crossings. And also he draws on um, sources such as um, Charles Darwin's reef drawings of Mauritius in the 1830s to um, show what this area of natural wonder looked like before it was devastated by anthropogenic climate change and now it's an extremely um, endangered marine environment. So an interesting uh, contemporary example then to remind us of the interrelationship between marine environments and colonial power. I've already mentioned at different points in these lectures the importance of post-colonial criticism um, and Caribbean studies to the blue humanities in, in, in so far as analysis of the sea, of its historical importance and of its trade routes and role in the transatlantic slave trade are absolutely central to thinking about oceanic contexts, the social and cultural and political contexts. Okay, so it's time now to think about Jason Decare's Taylor. So having looked at other examples of contemporary art, multimedia, painting, photography, and so on, um, it's now time to think about the set text for this week, which is the underwater sculptures um, that he has produced over a few years, and also to kind of raise this question of the relationship between art and activism as it relates to the oceanic or the blue humanities. So um, Jason Dekes Taylor is, is kind of a really unique figure in many ways. Um, he trained as a sculptor at the London Institute of Arts and then went on to develop a professional career as um, a, an underwater photographer for a time. He was a diving instructor. Um, he bought his own diving school in the Caribbean. He writes in, or he has spoken in an interview, about having grown up in Malaysia and he spent a lot of his childhood exploring the kind of reefs and islands around the coastal peninsula. And he's mentioned uh, this childlike wonder and, and the hope of discovering a kind of hidden fantasy world. As he says, in hindsight, I see that besides the solitude and adventure I discovered in these places, I was always fascinated by how nature had reclaimed human environments weather and plant life were slowly eroding away our marks and encroaching on these structures. That's something that comes up um, quite a lot in Anthropocene texts, whether it's photography, whether it's cinema and video, this idea of um, you know, human environments being reclaimed by nature, particularly uh, abandoned cities or Detroit even, you know, where there are empty lots and things. 
And De Kerr's Taylor credits his underwater installations as the sort of culmination of lots of years, which at the time he described as being quite directionless, um, sort of wandering about, um, and yet actually developing a very specific set of skills. So diving obviously gave him access to these marine environments as well as the experience needed to understand how they work. He also worked for a time um, as a graffiti artist and worked with street art when he was a student and he said that that gave him an appreciation of the ephemeral nature of aesthetic expression and of trying to capture these sort of brief moments in passing. Um, and he says that then working in underwater locations has reversed um, the usual artistic process. As the algae colonise and obliterate his underwater sculptures, he writes that instead of leaving my mark on the environment with my work, the environment is leaving its mark on my work. Um, so it really shifts the perspective from seeing the artist as a sort of human centred figure trying to leave something more durable and, and possibly even permanent on the landscape and it really thinks much more about the landscape itself. Um, and then working as a photographer prepared De Kerr's Taylor for thinking about um, how you would document these artworks. These artworks fade, they change, they continually evolve, they may disappear entirely in time and so the photographic document is all we have and for those of us who aren't lucky enough to go diving and off the west coast of Grenada, this book of photographs is all we have to understand what these site-specific oceanic artworks actually look like. And finally, he even worked as a set designer for a while. Um, and so that gave him experience of thinking about kind of composition and large scale and also the logistics. How do you build a set using cranes, load bearings and so on? And these were very helpful skills when he started trying to find underwater sites um, where he could um, secure these artworks. Um, I came across his work when I've been researching things to do with the oceanic humanities and I noticed a few references here and there. Um, interestingly, his work has occasionally will feature on the cover of a book maybe because they're just so kind of iconic looking now. So uh, one good example would be the Routledge Companion to the Environmental Humanities which came out in 2017 and they've got one of his photographs as the cover. And like many people, I think, um, you know, if you've seen any of these photographs before, or perhaps now you're seeing them for the first time, they leave this mark and you can't sort of shake the eerie quality, I think, of these images. As Carlo McCormick writes then, um, at some fundamental level, art works in areas beyond our understanding and articulation. Through means of representation and even abstraction, it shows us something we do not otherwise see puts to visual what eludes explanation in other terms. Um, and he goes on to say, I think this is from the other essay. Yeah, so this is uh, alongside Helen Scales, who I mentioned earlier, this is the other essay in, in the kind of the book of the Underwater Museum. Um, so he writes, much as early man looked to the vast unknown of the heavens above and projected a diagrammatic cosmology of animals and gods upon the stars, using the known and recognisable to make intelligible aspects of the universe beyond our ken, Jason de Kerr's Taylor proffers the identifiable as a kind of literal anchor by which we can navigate the mysteries of the ocean deep with some level of discernment that idea of mystery, the oceanic depths. I mean, in much of kind of visual and literary culture from the 17th century onwards, you know, the deep sea is a place of sort of terror and fear of krakens and other monsters. Um, you know, by the mid 19th century with Jules Verne's journey to the center of the earth and um, uh, uh, 40,000 leagues under the sea, um, it becomes a fantastical exotic other space to be perused from a safe comfort of, um, of a, a submersible, of a submarine, sorry, called Nautilus. Uh, it, it's a space that's, that tends to be kind of crossed and traversed and, and feared by sailors, obviously. So to, um, to engage with this sort of mystery uh, in the way that De Kerr's Taylor's sculptures do and to try and help us um, understand this um, alien environment is, is what it's all about. And actually, although producing these artworks is a high-tech um, 
project, you know, in order to um, to have access to the scuba technologies, the pressurized air tanks, these kind of latest techniques in casting, in marine biology and understanding the, the mammoth logistical challenges of lowering and situating concrete casts onto the seabed. That it's odd um, that these works actually recall something quite ancient and almost pre-modern. They uh, encourage our sense of wonder and ask us to reflect on our place within the broader ecosphere. Um, as, as Carlo McCormick then says, Decare's tailor is practicing a kind of art making that is as ancient and elemental as is conceivable in this 21st century civilization. Um, so we're thinking then about these sort of narrative possibilities being raised by these sculptures. Um, and, and in many ways, people have responded to them in religious terms, whether they're sort of secularized. People talk about the sacred um, uh, encounter, I guess, when they when they dive down and see some of these pieces. But it's a project fundamentally rooted in marine science and in the interventionist project of um, conservation, of constructing these habitats in dead zones of the seabed that are designed to attract corals, polyps, zook, uh, I'm never going to be able to pronounce this, zooxanthellae, I'll come back to them in a minute, and to help confront the existential threat facing biodiverse reef ecosystems in this context of kind of rapid climate change. I want to think for a moment about what has been re referred to as the um, stunning poetics of these underwater sculptural forms, their arresting wow factor. They've been compared, for example, to Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel. I think the pressing question then is to what extent might we consider them to suggest post-human aesthetic forms? So they've obviously been designed in response to site-specific marine environments, um, the specific environments where they are installed. Um, and these are, of course, um, these sculptures are the form of um, human labor and of human imagination. But at the same time, they've been designed to disappear to some extent to, as you can see here, really nicely illustrated, to become colonized by marine life. Reef building coral, um, which is to say the, the white skeleton, the calcium carbonate on which the polyps form and um, the zooxanthellae is notoriously fragile and it's very difficult to relocate it. So De Kerr's Taylor's sculptures are intended then to provide an artificial habitat for those very colourful polyps which populate coral and give coral reefs their vivid, intense diversity. Um, the zooxanthellae that I mentioned a moment ago are algal plant cells and they live inside each polyp, which, I mean, this is fascinating, the polyp itself is an animal, the zooxanthellae is a plant, but they live in this very tight kind of reciprocal relationship. Um, and they, uh, so the, the, the plant cells conduct photosynthesis, they suck in the carbon dioxide produced by the animal cells, uh, and they support cellular respiration by producing oxygen. So they provide these kind of essential nutrients. Um, and coral bleaching happens when those um, zooxanthellae and polyps die off. They're very finicky about temperature. So any slight increase in temperature will kill them off. And that's the coral bleaching is what we're left with is just the kind of cellular skeletal white habitat that's left behind. Coral reefs then are one of the most um, diverse, uh, biodiverse ecosystems on the planet. They're home to around a third of all marine species and yet they occupy just 1% of the oceans. So much life is hidden inside these coral reefs that scientists have developed the term cryptofauna as a kind of placeholder to name the unknown micro inhabitants. By as soon as 2050, scientists estimate that only 15% of the world's coral reefs will still be growing. Mass coral bleaching caused by oceanic acidification and warming temperatures will mean that the carbonate skeletons are actually going to dissolve and will be left with nothing. So it's an important project then, the, these underwater sculptures, um, in terms of providing habitat for endangered marine environments. And as I mentioned, it asks us to consider to what extent the human produced artwork 
merges with the marine environment that it has been designed for. And this is one of the texts that I, um, the visual images that I set for you, um, which we can talk about more in the seminar, but it's a fantastic example um, where you can see the original human subject who was photographed and then turned into um, the sculpture, the cast. Uh, and then you can see um, just a couple of years later how his image has become colonized underwater. Okay, so thinking about blue media then. Melody Jew, who is pictured here on the right, is um, a professor of English at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and she's also a keen snorkeler. She is one of the few academics who has written about Decaires Taylor's underwater sculptures in a forthcoming book. I'm not sure if it's actually out yet, but it should be out by the end of this year, titled Wild Blue Media, Thinking Through Seawater with um, Duke University Press. She argues that scuba diving offers new interpretive methodologies for blue humanities research, helping us to think about the ocean as an active environment that we might think through rather than a kind of passive object to be studied or analysed. So for her, the act of going out and snorkeling helps her to think and interact with the environment that she's interested in. Um, as she writes then, by understanding the ocean as a milieu where the weight and opacity of seawater transforms how information is created, stored, transmitted and perceived, this approach destabilises terrestrial-based ways of knowing and reorients our views of mediation from within the cold buoyancy of salt water with specific implications for literary interpretation and media theory by addressing the connections between environment and metaphor. Uh, it kind of echoes a point I made earlier about maritime law, you know, being derived from terrestrial frames of national sovereignty and legal frameworks and then just applied to the ocean, which doesn't really make sense in terms of the way that the oceans, you know, are fluid, mobile, global, uh, and so on. Um, so uh, Melody Jew looks at things like science fiction, she analyzes underwater memoir, ocean data visualizations, animal communication methods and also underwater art and she tries to think about how the ocean offers us a radically situated kind of knowledge. Um, in response to the underwater museum um, by Decares Taylor, she writes that and that's the quotation just up here, she says, seawater itself, the carrier of coral eggs and other life forms, figures as an artistic and evolutionary force that transforms the sculptures into colonies of organisms. It is not difficult to see these sculptures as views of a post-human future, of co-evolution between human and other species, and a blurring of boundaries between subject and environment. Which I'm just going to pop back to that image while I'm reading this quotation, because what she's just been saying, co-evolution between human and other species, a blurring of boundaries between subject and environment. Yet because the sculptures are primarily of human figures underwater, they appear somewhat uncanny, with eyes closed and no evidence of breathing, perhaps asleep, resting, or even ghostly. And you can see that here, the, 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 the cast has, um, the man's eyes are closed. So um, Jason DeCurse Taylor has um, refuted this particular reading, but many commentators of the few who have published um, uh, pieces about his work or have mentioned it in their books about other things, they interpret the underwater sculptures as offering some kind of memorial to the Middle Passage and of all the lives tragically lost at sea during the transatlantic slave trade. Um, for example, in a new book um, just coming out this year called Walter Graves um, by Valerie uh, Luascio, she writes that Decares Taylor's underwater sculptures communicate something sacred to the point, she says, at which the artist can become mistaken for a religious practitioner. So her argument is that in literally drowning these sculptures, which are human subjects, they're all figures, within the Caribbean and within the Atlantic, and also forcing visitors who want to see them to have to go underwater and submerge themselves to view them firsthand. Jason DeCares Taylor is enacting um, 
a, a famous poem by Derek Walcott called The Sea is History. And I've just got a little section of the poem for you here, but you can look it up online if you like. So Walcott connects biblical history. In this poem, he's talking about the Babylonian slavery described in Exodus with the Middle Passage to situate the sea as a watery site of historical remembrance. And, and by contrast, it's contrasted with the um, solid man-made um, structures of European history, you know, great cities, buildings, museums, and so on. Whereas the Caribbean natural world then is, um, is a fluid evolving site um, that cradles Caribbean notions of identity, of subjectivity and of history. And as such, it requires a particularly attuned kind of counter history or counter discourse to grasp. If the sea uh, around the Caribbean is the repository of Caribbean experience and history, it's, an, it's you know, extremely difficult to access this history or find it. It has disintegrated, you know, it's fallen to the seabed and dissolved and so on. So it's forgotten and it needs excavating and redeeming. So coming back then to Jason DeKerr's Taylor. So I guess it's a bit controversial and obviously you can disagree with authorial intentionality. That's what we do in literature. But um, whether you take at face value, his argument is I wasn't trying to create a memorial to those lost lives during the slave trade. I'm trying to do a kind of environmental art, uh, which is concerned with conservation. But you can obviously read it um, uh, as informed by Caribbean discourses, if that's what you're interested in. So let's think then about um, the point that Melody Jew made in reading these sculptures as kind of reflecting on the role of seawater itself. She called seawater an artistic and evolutionary force. And it's that sort of environmental post-humanities idea of the materiality of the water, of its own agency. It participates in the making of um, meaning uh, and so on, uh, as many other non-human agents do. I guess the first thing to consider then is the function of these sculptures in terms of conservation. And here I've just put together some points from the Helen Scales um, contextual chapter as a marine biologist she has explained to help us understand what these sculptures are doing. So first off then, they are made from pH neutral marine grade cement, free from other substances such as metals which might be harmful to marine life. So they being designed um, to be highly durable, which will help them stay solid and firm for many years, if, if not decades. And this allows slow growing corals plenty of time to create their own self-renewing edifices. By contrast, things like shipwrecks, which might be a habitat for corals, um, corrode too quickly to be stable ongoing habitats. So Jason DeKerr's Taylor leaves areas of rough texture on the sculptures and that's designed to help the larvae grip onto them. Um, there are kind of crevices and holes in these structural forms um, which are designed then to provide uh, shelter for shy reef dwellers. So things like lobsters um, and other creatures that need interior sh um, chambers to um, visit and live in. And they're also, I found this um, really interesting, they're very carefully located to help the coral dwellers find them. So they tend to be located just downstream of healthy coral reefs. Uh, and the idea is that when the larval flow happens and all of these larvae from the corals head off <laughs> down, downstream, they would attach themselves to these sculpture parks. And they are timed to maximise that larval flow, which follows lunar cycles. So the sculptures are deployed just before a larval flow is predicted to happen. And the reason why that's so important is that it prevents other things um, such as algae, uh, particularly large algae, from sort of colonising the sculptures and then making it difficult or impossible, um, you know, for, for other species to come along and monopolising the habitat. In some of the sculptures then the coral growth has been accelerated um, so conservationists will take storm damaged bits nubbins of coral um, and they might rear them in nursery um, uh, into nursery reared coral fragments and then they will directly attach them to the sculptures to help um, um, relocate uh, healthy bits of coral. 
And so by building a new habitat in um, featureless stretches of seabirds, they're always located somewhere empty or, or perhaps damaged, they relieve the pressure of tourism away from recovering natural reefs, but they also continue to help generating income from reef-based tourism, which is still needed for marine conservation. And of course, they're designed to educate tourists to think about how you can safely visit these sites um, and not accidentally damage them and with your tourism contribute to their ongoing decay. Um, okay. So um, as, as various um, critics have noted then, um, within a couple of years of each of these um, underwater kind of sculpture parks or series of sculptures that are located in different places where there had previously been no marine species at all, these structures are now um, vibrantly smothered in life. And you can see how they've, have they been successful in terms of providing new habitat for corals and polyps and zeaxanthellae and other marine species, fish and, and so on. Um, lobsters, crabs, sponges, algae, coral. But coming back to our kind of scholarly framework for reading the artworks then, I think in addition to their function in extending our understanding of the conservationist agenda, the underwater sculptures raise another really fascinating question. And for me, that is to what extent could we call them post-human? And how does a post-humanist understanding of art complicate ideas of aesthetics? So this raises serious, the serious question of whether animal species and the marine environment more broadly might play a role in, in the non-utilitarian capacity to express aesthetic pleasure. Um, non-utilitarian is a key kind of distinction here because it means that they're not just using aesthetic display or performance to attract a mate for the purposes of sexual reproduction, but to what extent can we actually qualitatively or quantitatively decide that they are expressing aesthetic pleasure for its own kind of useless purpose. And this question has been considered in relation to a few key species. So one of them is the Japanese male puffer fish, and I've got some pictures here, um, and the other is the Australian bowerbird. So um, in the 2014 BBC documentary series, BBC Earth, which was narrated by David Attenborough, um, a global audience, perhaps even maybe for the first time, became aware of the artistic capabilities of this tiny puffer fish, which Attenborough described as probably nature's greatest artist. Um, and so these images here are the um, artwork, so-called, that the fish created. Um, and just using his fins, uh, in, um, I'll just give you a little quotation from the voiceover of the documentary. Uh, a plan of mathematical perfection. He plows the sand, breaking it up into the finest of particles. These shells aren't just rubbish to be removed. He uses them to decorate the ridges of his construction. He can't rest for more than a moment, but he must work for 24 hours a day for a week or the current will destroy his creation. A final tidy up and his masterpiece is complete. Nowhere else in nature does an animal construct something as complex and as perfect as this. Um, the author and ethologist Jonathan Balcom uh, wrote a 2016 bestseller called What a Fish Knows. And he also talks about the Japanese puffer fish. And he says it might not be um, a piscine Picasso, but the Japanese puffer fish is not alone among fishes in using sand as a medium for aesthetic expression. Like the Australian bowerbirds, famous for the elaborate structures that they build to attract and impress females, many other fishes also build bowers to improve their mating prospects. Um, and so that reference, that comparative reference to the Australian bowerbird refers to a wider set of studies that look at the so-called display behavior that the male bowerbird will use to attract the female. Um, and as researchers have suggested, this involves an elemental aesthetic sensibility in both the male bowerbird to be able to produce his gorgeous bower and also the female bowerbird to have enough aesthetic judgment to choose among the bowers which bird she will go and mate with. Um, the male bowerbird then, uh, and you can see this in documentaries and clips on YouTube if you're interested, 
will inspect his work, they keep making changes and refinements, they might even steal little bits of treasure, magpie-like shiny things from another bowerbird's bower down, down the way. And the young males watch and learn from the older ones. So researchers argue then that aesthetic selection is being demonstrated. There is aesthetic judgment and sensibility here. There's um, a German philosopher of aesthetics, a uh, contemporary philosopher called Wolfgang Welsh, and he's one of very few philosophers who are trying to think about this idea of animal aesthetics. And I think this is pertinent. Um, as he writes then, um, uh, Charles Darwin noted the aesthetic contrivances within the animal kingdom in examples such as um, the lustrous tail feathers of the peacock, the plumage of hummingbirds, and he says that these things seemingly do not contribute to the survival or even the reproductive chances of these birds. So the peacock's tail, for example, impedes flight and might be considered an evolutionary hazard to its survival. So why have they survived? So writing in The Descent of Man in 1871, Darwin then suggested that insofar as peacocks and peahens have to exhibit some kind of aesthetic sensibility, um, and I quote, there is no discontinuity between us and the rest of the animal kingdom, even if our aesthetic tastes are more developed than those of other animals. So this idea that Darwin suggested um, on a continuum between human aesthetics and animal aesthetics, it actually extends beyond the more charismatic mammals into what Darwin termed the low animals, things like corals, sea anemones and jellyfish, um, which he described as um, ornamented and striped and shaded in a very elegant kind of manner. And if we follow Darwin as, as figures like Wolfgang Welsh and other theorists of aesthetics are doing, we might then uncouple the utility of aesthetics in terms of reproductive, increasing reproductive chances through colourful tail feathers and things from this, just this basic idea of aesthetic appreciation proper, beauty for beauty's own sake, useless beauty, you might even call it. And can we infer then that animals themselves exercise aesthetic judgment? And how would our inescapably anthropocentric frames of reference even pass this possibility? It's, um, it's obviously very difficult to get our head around. We're trapped within our own kind of anthropocentric frames of reference. So how can we develop a post-humanist understanding without not being human anymore? Studies of animal cognition and language are very widespread now, but there actually aren't that many studies that have looked um, specifically as, at aesthetic perception. Okay, so coming back then to Jason Decare's Taylor's sculptures. Um, the process of aesthetic production in the underwater sculptures is designed to be this site-specific collaboration between the, the cement sculptures and the marine environments that are built in and around them and that will slowly colonize, distort and maybe even destroy them. Do we think that these oceanic artworks function simply as artificial habitats for the corals and the polyps and their marine visitors and residents? Or if we follow the line of argumentation I've just outlined in this post-Darwinian idea of animal aesthetics then, can we say that species like fish and algae are involved in their own entangled aesthetic creations? Or is it that these sculptures are just going to push us as close as we're ever going to get to a particular kind of post-humanist art, which relies on the marine environment for its evolution and its continual processual and ever-changing character? I think this brings us back then, and I just want to close with this idea of post-humanist theory and post-humanism as a, as a method and I've got a quotation here for you from Carrie Wolfe, who's one of the key figures in his 2009 book, What is Posthumanism? So he writes, the question of posthumanism, far from surpassing or rejecting the human, actually enables us to describe the human and its characteristic modes of communication, interaction, meaning, social significance and affective investments with greater specificity once we have removed meaning from the ontologically closed domain of consciousness, reason, reflection, and so on. It forces us to rethink our taken for granted modes of human experience, including the normal perceptual modes and affective states of Homo sapiens itself. 
by recontextualizing them in terms of the entire sensorium of other living beings and their own auto-poetic ways of bringing forth the world. Ways that are, since we ourselves are human animals, part of the evolutionary history and behavioral and psychological repertoire of the human itself. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, what really stands out um, from this idea is, uh, is to recontextualize our understanding in terms of the entire sensorium of other living beings and trying to imagine that they bring forth their own world, that they create and express aesthetic design and pleasure. And how do we try and understand that as, as humans? And what does that tell us about our own human nature? Uh, to, to close with the um, marine biologist Helen Scales then, and I think this is the kind of utopian strand in some sense of sort of the hope of these kinds of artworks that are engaged in interventionist projects of marine conservation and also educating visitors and viewers um, as well. She says that de Kerr's Taylor's sculptures show how beautiful things can emerge from disaster, how there is hope for rebuilding and restoring natural wonders. She says nature has immense powers to regrow and recover if we just give it a chance. And I think for me, that was a really clear echo of the Anna Lowen Haupt Sing extracts that I set you in week three when we were thinking about mycology, mycelial networks. Uh, and again, Anna Lowen Haupt Sing's book, um, you know, privileging the mushroom as, as an example of an organism that flourishes and has thrived in situations of catastrophe such as atomic uh, fallout areas like Chernobyl um, and can help us to kind of reorient our mental apparatus. How are we going to continue to live with an ongoing disaster in ecological and climatological terms and what hope is there um, for the beautiful things that might emerge from disaster? Okay, thank you so much. Um, have a look at the set um, images that I popped onto Moodle for you. And um, I think there's a short activity there, pre-sessional task for you. And I really look forward to hearing your thoughts in our seminar next week. Okay, thanks everyone. Take care.